Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, CES. Uh, get your Bibles out and go to the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 4, beginning with verse 20. Before we start the study, though, let's say hello to everybody. Uh, Sister Renee, you want to say hi to the congregation? Oh, if I have to. I'm very happy to see a nice turnout. We've already got 26 before the program even started. Thank you for being faithful, hanging out and waiting on us. We are looking forward to continuing our study through the Pauline epistles. And I, you know, I loved Ephesians before. Galatians was my favorite, but I'm finding there is some tremendous depth to the verses uh, as we go through them. So I'm looking forward to it tonight. Yeah. Well, you gave us a little sample of your acting skills there, the way you feigned, you feigned at me in the beginning. That was very good. I like it when you play along with me. Did you ever do much like improvisation? Yeah, I did, actually. Yeah, yeah. we had the Brownling Theater right down the street from me on Melrose. Yeah. That was always fun to do. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I had a, took a speech class when I was in the eighth grade, and that I, I got very interested in theater. But I, I never performed or did anything in the theater. But uh, I, I, we, we would practice and imp, imp, improvisational situations and stuff. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it always is. Mm. It's the best laughs too. <laughs> All right, Ben, say hello, please. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, yeah, what Renee just said. I was thinking about early today about the, how deep the verses are. Uh, the Bible is very deep, and um, it's you know one of the, one. Of the, yeah, I, I used to, as an unbeliever, look for evidence of the Bible's truthfulness uh, for out, outside of the Bible in the world, you know, just different archaeology and things like that. But to me, the most profound evidence now is the Word itself. It's uh, it it certainly is the Word of God, and it it is um, it 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 it, it is very deep, and it's uh, definitely not uh, not written by man. So I'm looking forward to the study tonight. Yeah, we all say Amen to that, brother. It's uh, well, I don't know what verses were or that are coming up. Uh, apparently, we've got some exciting verses to go over, so uh, I'm eager. Let, let's see uh, the chat room who's there. Uh, okay, well, first, let me thank the uh, moderators. Uh, you know that the moderators serve as deacons in our church, so they they have a big responsibility, uh, and we we couldn't really function without them. So, thank you, uh, Brother uh, Anthony, and uh, we got Sister Heather. Uh, Brother Kevin, Brother Hendricks, all uh, moderators. So thank you for being there and serving us in that way. Uh, so blessings to everybody. Let's let's begin uh, uh, in the KJV chapter four, beginning with verse twenty. It says, "But ye have not so learned Christ. If so, be that ye have heard him." and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I had to read that together, just so I didn't know where to stop. So uh, through verse 23, Sister Renee. Yeah, <laughs> well, just to recap, Continuing on thought here that Paul is encouraging the church of Ephesus. We were saying that this proves that the majority of the Ephesian, Ephesian church, which, by the way, was known for its goddess Diana uh, temple. It was a massive temple there. Um, and this was a large Gentile congregation. And he's reminding them how they should be walking in the Lord. So uh, he says. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. And I would ask anybody that accuses all of us that trust only in the shed blood of Jesus, 
that they accuse us of love and sin just because we don't tell you you're dangled over hell constantly or you can lose your salvation just because we're secure in Christ. Why? Because we have not so learned Christ. The Christ in us does not encourage us to walk in lasciviousness and his grace. And none of us believe his grace is a cloak for iniquity. So uh, we can see here that Paul is encouraging them to live godly lives because to walk in lasciviousness and uncleanness and greediness, we have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Uh, you stopped at 23? Yes, I finished. Okay. I read through 23. And the important thing here is this is one of the verses that ex explain there's two men. All right. Once you're saved, there's the old man and that's the flesh, the sinful flesh that wars against the spirit. And then the new man, the new man, the reborn spirit man in Christ. And so uh, this is one of those verses that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So take him off, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So you can see here that if a Christian doesn't take off the old man, you can't tell the difference between a Christian and an unsaved person. If they keep the old man on and walk in him. And so Paul is telling them that and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the way a person uh, gets changed in their life, it's not a magical transformation. Being born again is not a thing that has to do with our flesh or our behavior. Did you hear that? Being born again is a work of God that is supernatural that happens in the spirit realm. You cannot see it. It is not something that you can see or recognize or verify, all right, by behavior change. It has nothing to do with that. It is your new man. So Paul says, take off the old man and everything that comes with him. And that is the lust of the flesh. And be, re be renewed uh, by the, what is it? The spirit, how do you put that? Uh, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the key to that is to have our minds filled with things of Christ, how he lived, how he instructed us to live, and his word. That's how you see change in a person's life. Because they spend a lot of time in God's word once they're saved. Not because uh, of some magical thing that happens, uh, because we still have sinful flesh. That's why every epistle is correcting this behavior that people should hear the, the, the spirit's voice and not the old man's voice. So it's proof right there that every believer still has to contend with sinful flesh. It's just ridiculous to say that that's not true. And that Paul in Romans was talking about before he got saved. When he said, I am carnal, sold under sin, the good that I would, that I don't, the thing that I hate, that I do, who will save me from this body of death? He was still in that body of death. He wasn't talking about before he got saved. He was talking about the battle between the old man and the new man. And this is one of those verses that clearly distinguishes that. Amen. Well said, sister. Thank you. Um, all right, Ben, I gave you a bunch of verses there. What do you say? Yeah, um, a couple things are interesting. Um, one is, it says, okay, verse 20 says, it says, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. That if statement is, um, it, it, it's a first class condition, it's, it's a first class construction in the Greek, which implies the proposition is true. So since the believers in Ephesus had heard, um, heard, heard Christ, and had been taught by him through through the apostles, they really have no excuse for for living like the unbelievers. Um, so again, it's not if like oh if like uh, whether it's assuming it's it's a, it's a reality. It, it's it's assuming it's a um, it's a truth. So uh, they ha the, Paul is saying that you have heard him and you have been taught by him, uh, and because of this, um, you have put off uh, you that you put off concerning your former conduct 
the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And um, the I've heard uh, I'm not going to go into detail here, but the uh, I've heard it argued very convincingly uh, that 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 the word there where it says uh, that you put off it's not it's not a command that to say you, you put him off. I mean, there's other scriptures that definitely say yes, put off the old man, but this is actually uh, saying no because you have put off the old man. So it's not saying it's not an exhortation. Uh, uh, to say put off the old man, it's saying because you already have put him off, um, that you should now uh, you should no longer live like the Gentiles. Um, so again, the Greek uh, supports that. It's, it, it's I think it's something like the aorist tense. So it means that it already happened is a final action with continuing results or abiding results. Uh, and that's also uh, I think um, drawn out by a parallel verse in Colossians uh, three. 9 through 310 where it says uh do not lie to one another since you uh, since you have put off the old man with his deeds so he's, he's saying there don't lie to each other anymore because you already put off that old man he's dead so why why give him life essentially um and so it says yes do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Um, and then I thought there's that, uh, a, a, an interesting quote here I uh, found that I think is uh, kind of interesting. Rene, Rene will probably get a kick out of this. Um, so this is a quote. It says, The reason so many Christians struggle to live right is because they have an identity crisis. They are identifying with the wrong man in their minds. It reminds me of a time when a woman got on an elevator in a tall New York building office building and discovered that the only other individual in the elevator was none other than Robert Redford, the movie star. As the elevator slowly climbed upward, she finally mustered enough courage to ask, are you the real Robert Redford? He smiled and said, only when I'm alone. <laughs> that's cute. Wow, that's good. That's, that's good though, Ben. Yeah. That's a profound, wise statement by, by Robert Redford. Hmm. Um, okay, was that it, Ben? Thank you. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read those verses in the Amplified and see if it help, it's helpful at all. Uh, it says, um, But you did not learn Christ in this way. If, in fact, you have really heard him and have been taught by him, just as truth is in Jesus, revealed in his life and personified in him, that regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self, uh, that is, completely discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires, and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude. Uh, well, I don't know uh, the, the uh, forthcoming verses. Uh, how much of this is going to come up? And I don't. I didn't read ahead. I don't. I don't have this chapter memorized, so uh, I'm only guessing. Uh, so I'll, I'll say that. Some people think that um, uh, there, it's entirely Christ and it's entirely the Holy Spirit and we have no role to play in any of this, the salvation or the sanctification or anything. Um, uh, one view, uh, Calvinism, they, they want to emphasize that uh, man has nothing to do with it so much that they, they take it so far, it, be, it becomes really absurd and, and evil, what they turn God into, uh, that man uh, is completely God that saves us uh, without us even being aware of it or interested, or we just get saved because God does it, not because we chose to believe or because we uh, have a desire for God or anything, any of those things, it's completely God. This is what they call uh, monergism uh, and versus synergism. Um, monergism means mono is one, and so it's only one that, that has, is doing it, God completely. Synergism is that 
uh, there's some kind of cooperation going on. Uh, and that God does put something and man does something. So what is it? If, if you, if I, I do believe in it's synergism, uh, but we are not contributing in by changing our life and, and uh, getting sin out of our life and doing good works the way the Lordship heresy tells us. Uh, but we do have a, a part to play. Otherwise, the doctrine of Calvinism of, of unconditional election would be true. That means that, that people are saved with unconditionally. Uh, but there is a condition, and the condition is believing. So um, there was a church, uh, let me see, what, they, what were they called? Uh, 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 Great, it was called Grace Faith 08. It's a very good pastor, very good teacher. Check check them out. But Grace Faith 08, um, they, they structured their name based upon this concept that grace and faith, are, grace is God's role, faith is our role. In other words, some people are teaching that we, we can't even have faith, and that God has to give us faith, and, God, and it's God's faith, not our own. And uh, I do object to that. We, we do have our own faith is needed. We have to believe and it, it's up to us to, to, to do it or not. So there is a, a, a cooperation. God provides salvation for everyone, but not everybody receives it. So we need to re receive it through faith. Um, I don't remember what made me go off into that. Oh yeah, because we're, we're talking about the role of the, the, this, uh, this effort that we, I believe what we're gonna learn is that man is supposed to be making an effort. Uh, yes, the Holy Spirit wants to transform us, but we need to make some kind of an effort. We do have a role to play in this uh, progressive sanctification, as was discussed last week. Our role is we need to be willing to listen to the Holy Spirit and respond instead of instead of rejecting it. And and uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, not grieving. What is it when you uh, you don't hear the the Spirit? There's a there's a Quench. A Bible. Quench. Quench. Well, quench is when you can no longer hear it, but before that, something happens. It's uh, uh, there's grieving, quenching. Uh, well, okay, I don't know. I, you, I always call it prompting. The Spirit is prompting us, urging us on to do different th things in our life, to change our attitudes, change our behavior, and we can either resist it or we can embrace it. And so our role is to respond to the Holy Spirit and be willing to uh, surrender our will over and, and give, give uh, and there's a song about giving Jesus the steering wheel. And, and, and that's kind of, kind of what I'm saying here is that, um, yes, uh, the Holy Spirit does the transforming, but our role is to not resist it, but embrace it. All right. Uh, did I read it in the... Uh, Already or not, I don't even remember if I read those verses in the Amplified. Yeah, you did. Okay. I talked so long I confused myself. So, all right. I guess anything else before I go to the next verse? Well, I would I would just agree with you that um, we have the Holy Spirit, Spirit, and the Holy Spirit not only convinced us uh, of truth, um, when we when we uh, saw when we uh, acknowledged the truth. And, and we're saved, but the, the, you know through faith. So the Christian life is, is begun through faith and it's lived through faith. And um, you know once we're saved, we we know we have the truth. Uh, the Holy Spirit's with us forever. It it's not going to leave us. And we it, it, you know it should teach us that we should be abiding in His Word. And we you know that's a that's a choice we all make every day uh, whether or not we're going to do that. Um, or not, not even just necessarily abide in his word, but abide in, in, in sound doctrine and teaching. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, choose to be renewed every day with uh, new truth or additional truth or amplification of the truth. Um, so it is, I think it's very, very volitional. Um, the, I, I see the Holy Spirit as our, basically our, our, our light and our guide, and it's our choice to follow that or not. We can, we can reject it at any point. Um, Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. then, uh, it, you made a good point there because a lot of the Calvinists will say, well, if you don't continue living for the Lord, you were never really saved. You're not really one of the elect. You didn't persevere. 
and they actually pray that people die in the faith at their funeral. It's just really horrible. Uh, totally not understanding that we still have free will as Christians to serve the Lord or to serve our flesh. And all of these epistles tell us to make the right choice because before when we were darkened and blind, we had no power to do anything good, but now we do, we do. So um, I'm so glad you mentioned that it is a daily choice. And that choice is a matter of discipline, blessing, et cetera, uh, reward, but not salvation. And so many make it a salvation issue. I'm glad you mentioned we have that choice daily. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. All right. And um, all right, Brother Ben, I'm going to read verse uh, 24 now. It says, I'll read 23 and, and 24 together. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wow. Um, well, so yes, I mean, the new man should teach us that we, we, uh, we, that the old man uh, should remind us that the old man is dead. And so why, why give that old man life again? Um, through, you know, why animate that old man uh, by living in sin and, and, and living in what we, what we died to? Um, and I think part of the renewing of the mind is, is rect you know, again, every day uh, recognizing yourself dead to sin and alive to God. So, um, you know, there, there was a time, I remember when I first, first got saved, I, I had a, you know, this big, I was carnal. And um, one of the things I, I, I uh, that kind of seemed sad to me was that a lot of the things that I liked in this world that didn't seem so e that didn't seem so evil and even they are probably pro probably pretty neutral, but they they were things that I just didn't um I I just felt like oh well um like like tragedy like tra tragedy would would you know kind of add a um it, it could add um. I'm not gonna have a hard time articulating this, but it could have like um, a tragedy could be romantic in some respects, and so things like that. Where I I, I thought, well, geez, I, what 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 would what 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 uh, how can how can you know how can um how can I reconcile these two things? Where you know, some, again, sometimes tragedy is beautiful in, in its own in its own way, just not not the tragedy itself, but what comes out of it. The you know sometimes pain. Uh, uh, brings um, I don't know. You, you appreciate things through pain and things like that. So I, I just had a hard time reconciling that. And then over time, um, I realized even like you know it took me a long time. But as this you know as I allowed the spirit to re renew my mind, I realized this everything that I I um, I, uh, I I loved in this world and I I, I chased after is just it just. Even the things I really liked, like um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a computer guy, so I really loved, I still, I really loved computers, and I just, I, I just could not conceive of a world that didn't have, where I couldn't use those talents, like in eternity, for example, and um, I, I get it, I just couldn't, I could not conceive of it. But over time now, it's been about ten years, uh, I'm happy to get get rid of these things, you know. All these things have become a distraction in our lives. We're constantly distracted by this technology. I mean, yes, it's good in some respects, but of course, man always twists things and makes things. Um, you know, it'll, it'll men always will find a, an evil purpose for all all things. Um, so I, I'm happy to get rid of all this stuff and go back to a simple life, uh, where there's no there's no technology. Um, but also um, another thought too is that um, where it says uh, God created a. Uh, the, the new man, which God created in righteousness and true holiness. We talked about last week about um, sanctification and uh, our different views of, of what sanctification was. Um, I, I kind of held the view. I think Renee did too. Uh, I don't remember correctly, fully, but I, I, I believe that um, the Bible does uh, indicate that, you know, we, we are sanct sanctified or holy. Sanctification and holy and set apart, they're all kind of synonyms to me. Um, and I think the Bible uses them kind of interchangeably that way. It means set apart, essentially. And again, we're, we're positionally sanctified in Christ forever. We're no longer associated with the world. We're no longer associated as being in Adam. We're, we're now associated uh, as being in Christ. 
but also from a, a practical, um, you know, uh, uh, from a practical righteousness perspective, as, as we're supposed to live out our life. Um, I believe the Bible does teach that there's there's a holiness or a sanctification process there that again is part of renewing our mind. Uh, one of the verses that comes to mind is um, well, it's in the Old Testament, but Peter uh, quotes it. It says, uh, "Be holy, for I am holy." Um, and some people would say, uh, "Well, that's." I heard some people teach actually that that's a, a verse to unbelievers. Uh, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> God would not tell an unbeliever to be holy because I am holy. Uh, they're not even, that, that, that's not their father. Um, uh, so he tells a believer to be holy because I am holy because you're supposed to be, you're supposed to reflect the character of your father just like Jesus perfectly uh, reflected the character of his father. Um, and so again, it, we are commanded to be, to live a holy life, to, to uh, live a life that's set apart uh, that that's in service to God and to our fellow believers, because um, we're not really we're not really um, our own anymore. We really belong to, as believers, we belong to each other. We belong to God, and um, and that's what we should be looking to do. Uh, and I think actually uh, looks like the next verses actually touch upon that. So I'll I'll stop there. All right, thank you. All right, Sister Renee. Yeah, I mean it's a continuing thing here. The the old guy's dead, as Ben said. Uh, he's off, so put the new one on. Uh, and as the letter continues, you'll see how he uh, describes that. So when he says that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the new man, the person you truly are, is in Christ and it's made after God. And is created in righteousness and true holiness. So we should reflect that truth now, even though we still have this dead flesh we walk around in. You know, most people are just simply the walking dead. They are. They're dead. Uh, they don't have, they are not alive in Christ. They do not have, everybody's talking about the spirituality and this guy is so spiritual. No, you're not. Your spirit is dead. It is cut off from the source of life and so it's a fake light all these other ways new age etc uh but they're basically dead uh until they're brought to life in christ and so the new man we're supposed to walk that truth and if a christian a believer is living a carnal life it doesn't mean they're not saved. It means they're not walking in their identity in Christ. That's what that means. And there's consequence for it, but salvific loss is not one of them. But he'll go on to explain some of the ways that we should put on this uh, new man, meaning walk him out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Let me read 23 and 24 in the Amplified. It says, and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, that is, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude, and put on the new self, that is, the regenerated and renewed nature, created in God's image, godlike in the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. Um, well, uh, that, um, that last phrase there, uh, um, that expresses, uh, to God, your gratitude for self salvation. Um, I do think that's a wonderful, um, attitude, uh, that, uh, I, I would hope that we all have that attitude. And the, the scriptures do say that we love him because he first loved us. So uh, it, we're, the, the response to, to the love God has for us, as a matter of fact, this is what was so profound the night that I got saved. I, I, I just, it's, it'll never be uh, foggy, I guess. This is something that'll always be very clear in my memory is that I, it, it, when I finally realized that God, and I knew, I, I, I imagined how great God was, the the magnitude of the creation and the uh so i i had this awe for god and 
I realized that I was a speck, less than a speck, not even like 1% of a speck as far as why should he care about me? And yet, this God, this great God loved me personally so much, he was willing to die for me. That just blew me away. That, that was, that overwhelmed me. And my response was, was I wept. They, they were not tears of contrition or remorse or repentance of sin, the kind of things that some people will say that they had or that uh, you need to have. They, they were joyful tears to recognize that this great God loves me that much. It's, I, it just blew my mind. And of course, I didn't have to make an effort. I, I didn't have to make a des decision to, to love him. My reaction was I loved him back. I couldn't help it. So this idea here that it has here uh, in this Amplified that uh, uh, it says, um, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. Uh, yeah, uh, but I don't, I don't think we should try to impose on somebody some kind of a guilt trip that don't you think you ought to, uh, you know, uh, really get your act together because uh, because. Uh, God loves you so much, or because God paid for your sins. We're, we're, we shouldn't be doing it because we are feeling like, oh, well, gee, it's a, it's kind of a, um, an obligation. It, it, it really shouldn't. We shouldn't be feeling obligated. We, we should just naturally love God and desire to uh, want to uh, 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 have fellowship with, with God uh, without thinking that it's, it's some kind of a, a work or an obligation that we're under. Um, but the idea of uh, uh, this new man put on the new self, uh, well, I said this uh, recently in one of our other studies that uh, what, do you, what do we need to do if, if we want this to be, to be successful in terms of this sanctification process this spiritual growth and maturity to assist that, to be part of that, actively involved in, 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 in uh, your own growth. Yes, the spirit will, will uh, change us and, and, uh, uh, and not only gives us life, but, but renews us and transforms us. But if we cooperate, it's going to be so much better, so much faster, so much greater uh, if we want to cooperate. Uh, now, so how do you do that? Um, Think of the old man and the new man as uh, uh, one of them is going to be in control and dominate. Uh, you want the new man to dominate and the old man to wither away and, and, and die off. And the way you do that is, which one will you feed? If you're feeding the old man, let's say doing all the worldly things that we've all done in the past and, and keeping, you know, staying interested and involved in all the worldly things instead of, uh, the spiritual things, then you're feeding the old man. And he'll, the old man, the nature will, will stay strong in you, and the, the, the new man will not be uh, uh, the dominant in your personality. But if you feed the new man, uh, uh, the uh, born-again child of God, regenerated uh, uh, person with a new nature, if you feed him, then uh, he's going to grow and dominate, and the the old, the old man will die off. How do you feed the new man? I believe there's four things. But maybe there's five or six or ten things, but there's four things I, I've always said we we should be doing, and that is we need to uh, be in prayer. Paul says continue instant in prayer. That means that our prayer should be a constant prayer. Only uh, only time we're not praying is when we're busy doing something that. It distracts us and we're not can't pray as soon as our mind is free from a task it should be the natural thing to start talking to the lord and uh, uh so prayer um uh, bible study uh and uh, fellowship and um uh, ministry works uh being being part of the body of christ finding what your part is in the body and then get busy uh, serving in that way. 
So if we do these four things, if we actively are involved in doing these four things, prayer, Bible study, fellowship, and ministry works, or service, or discipleship, whatever you want to call that, uh, then you're going to be feeding the new man, and you're, the, the new man will dominate, and the old man will die off, and, and as the old desires that you had will just pretty much disappear. Brother uh, Luke, yes. you said something very important about how you were touched by, moved by God's love for you. This is the issue with them corrupting the gospel and putting conditions on whether he will save you. Like you got to be willing to do this or promise to do that. or commit. It belittles God's love message to you. It makes it conditional. God only loves you if you live up to it or if you promise to try to be good later, you know, and, and you never get the full revelation of God's love. And, and that is why these people cannot understand why we don't look, love our sin. We don't live any worse than they do. We love God because we have this revelation of his immense love for us. And we're secure because we know our father. We know his promises. We know he's faithful. And, and that doesn't encourage rebellion to him. It doesn't make me want to disobey my dad more because I'm aware of how much love he has for me. And it'll never cast me out or forsake me. But when that message is belittled, they never receive what you got that night. Most don't. And so I think that's an important thing that is missing when the gospel is corrupted, is our revelation of God's love for us, literally without condition. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Um, any more, be or should I move to the next verse? Well, real, real quick, I like what you said about starving the old man, uh, but lest anyone be confused about that, um, you know, I, I think uh, there's two ways to kind of starve the old man, so to speak. Um, uh, he'll never die until, I mean, it, it, the sin nature, essentially, will never, it will always be with us until we are glorified. But um, with regards to starving the old man, uh, a lot of Lord shippers, what they, what they, what they see, read those verses and uh, would, would, would interpret that what you said, they would say, oh, well, we'd starve him by... Uh, by um, basically trying to walk by the law and uh, not, you know, knowing the law and focusing on the law and making sure we don't we don't trans transgress the law, which is exactly what Renee said earlier about what Paul was at in his his. I think he, as a brand new saved believer, he was trying to figure out, okay, how do I how do I please God in my walk, and how do I live a vic a victorious uh, Christian life and not condemned to to uh, to to the sin nature. He was trying to do it through the law, I believe. Uh, he was trying to figure out, okay, well, I know I'm saved by grace, but where's the law at, and how do I walk? Um, and he was trying to do it by by, by law principle, and uh, he found that would that was uh, that he, he was defeated. He, in fact, he he cried out, you know, who's going to rescue me from this body of death? Uh, but that's when he realized, okay, yes, it's not in my power, but by leaning on and yielding to and uh, uh, walking after the Spirit. You basically ignore the old man because you have you have something better. You don't have you don't have you're not trying to you, you realize okay you nothing you could do in the flesh is going to please God. It's only after this walking after the Spirit can you please God, and I believe it, it's lived by, by victoriously by exactly what, what something that Peter and this is all through the Bible, but what Peter said too and Peter Second Peter verse Second uh, Peter one verse four says by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. And again, uh, it's those promises that, that should motivate us, not trying to please God by not doing things or, uh, you know, uh, trying to, trying to please God through the law. It's through, through faith. And it's, it's realizing, okay, sin is no longer an issue between you and God and he wants you to walk by faith and uh and by you know again renewing your mind uh learning about him adding to your adding to your faith knowledge uh, brotherly love um virtue etc the things that he mentions in second peter one those are how you starve uh 
uh, so to speak, the the sin nature, the old man. Uh, it's not by focusing on oh I, I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm not going to uh, you know whatever sin it may be. Uh, say it's overeating. I'm not going to overeat today and focus on that. Well, it, you're eventually going to give into it if that if that's what you're the law arouses sin in the in, in the flesh. So you're you're eventually going to succumb to it. It's a matter of time. The only way to escape it is focus on something that's better than that, and that is. Uh, the promises that God has for us, the things of the Spirit. Um, so, I just want to, uh, you know, I thought that was a good tie-in for what 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 Renee said, mentioned earlier. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go on to uh, verse twenty-five, Renee and uh, KJV. It reads, "Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor." For we are members one of another. Yeah, this is uh, his instructions here of what the new man should look like, uh, how to how to put the new man on. Uh, and so, first thing he says is when it says wherefore, it's continuing the thought. So he's saying, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So again, he's reminding us all that we're one body, many members. Uh, what we do to someone else in the body, we do to ourselves because we are part of the same body. Uh, and so uh, this is him continuing to tell us or tell the Ephesians how to put on the new man. Uh, and there's quite a list here. All right. Thank you, sister. Okay, uh, Brother Ben, verse 25. Well, I don't have a lot to add to that. Um, like, like Renee said, and, and uh, it, uh, we, we, we belong to one another, essentially. We're one body. So if we're, if we're lying to each other, it's kind of like we're lying to ourselves. And we're, and we're lying to God. So uh, there's, there's no need for that. You know, we should be open and honest with one another, admitting our weaknesses. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think a lot of time, a lot of people we lie. To, people lie to each other because they're they're embarrassed about some kind of weakness they have, or um, you know, whatever the reason is. And I think uh, I think we should, if we're if we're honest with each other, it's uh, it's only gonna make us more um, understanding of each other and um, willing to uh, it may, you know may may open up an opportunity to to reach out and help it out, help out a brother or sister that, that's in need. Um, there's no reason to, to lie about it and make it sound like you're strong or you're not struggling with something. Um, it, 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 I think it's good to be honest with one another and say, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I have this weakness or I uh, need help in this area. Um, it, it, again, it's an opportunity to, to serve one another. Hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. It says, therefore, rejecting all falsehood, whether lying, defrauding, telling half-truths, spreading rumors, any such as these. Speak truth, each one, with his neighbor, for we are all parts of one another, and we are all parts of the body of Christ. Well, um, in the uh, KJV, uh, it says, put away lying, and then the Amplify certainly did Amplify, and they're saying that it lying it, it is broader than lying. And it gives us an examples of the type of lying, the kind of the categories. These are all lying. Defrauding is a form of lying. Anything that's being dishonest, I think, is what they're, the point they're making. Let's be honest. Whether lying, defrauding, telling half-truths. See, uh, a lot of times people, uh, they'll concede that telling a half a truth is deceptive and, dishon and dishonest, in fact, a lie. Uh, I think they could also have amplified and put it in that uh, 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 omitting to, to tell the truth, uh, neglecting to tell the truth, keeping, keeping silent rather than saying the truth. Sometimes if you... Um, rather than giving an outright lie, 
but if the opera if if, you, if it's up to you to to clarify and say what the truth is and you fail to do that you just remain silent uh, that would be also being dishonest so i i would also include that uh a half truth or, or uh, just failing to uh to tell the truth um so I guess that's all I, I have to say that, that uh, the idea of lying, it's, it's, it's broader than just lying. You know, have you ever thought about why lying is such a common uh, uh, sin that's brought to our attention? Uh, uh, we, we've mentioned that these lists that, that Paul and Jesus have given us, uh, uh, if you look at the whole list of sins, um, Let's say fornications, uh, uh, adultery, um, uh, blas blasphemy, or whatever it is on the list. It, uh, many of us could look at that list and, and feel pretty good about ourselves, saying, "Well, gee, I haven't done that. I haven't done that. I haven't done that." And then you get to lying, and I believe lying is there uh, not because lying is uh, uh, like here. Lying is singled out; it's the only thing mentioned. So you would think that. Well, it must be pretty serious that he, they're, they're, they're singling out lying as, the, as a problem. But uh, I think the great value of, of pointing out our lying as, uh, is that we're all guilty of that. Uh, if, you can, if you could tell me, well, Luke, I never committed adultery. Okay, well, good for you. And there's probably a lot of things that you've, you've uh, been faithful to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing. But at least when it comes to lying, we've all lied. We all of lied, how many lies have you told? I mean, if, if you lied once a day, that's 300, over 300 lies a year. In 10 years, it's 3,000. In 50 years, that's 15,000 lies. 15,000, that would make, make you like a, like a serial killer or a serial murderer. Well, you're a serial liar. You know, your whole life has been dedicated to thousands and thousands of lies. And when I say you, I'm saying me, us. Um, I'm I am more sensitive about it uh, now. Um, I admitted rec a, re a, a recent lie that, that people want to talk about, but uh, um, I, I told a lie recently that uh, people have um, wanted to remind me of, and I don't mind because uh, I admit that I did. But I rationalized it in that I wanted to avoid the drama at the time because I knew that if I told the whole truth, uh, then it, it, it would be a real dramatic scene that I didn't want to deal with at the moment. Uh, also, in order to spare the other person's feelings, because if I told the whole truth, it would really hurt them. So those are the ways that I was rationalizing in my mind that it was necessary for me to lie. Uh, I'm not saying that that gives me the, uh, the right, I did the right thing. Uh, I didn't. But uh, the point is, as much as I don't want to lie, I, I'm still, at this point in my life, 34 years as a Christian, I still can lie. And I remember a few years ago, I had a doctor's appointment, and I was, didn't want to go for some reason, but I was going to call him up, but rather than just tell them that tell them that I needed to reschedule it, uh, I I felt that I was I needed to think of an excuse. You know what? It, it, it dawned on me. Wait a second. Not only is it unnecessary, I don't need to give them a reason. I just need to tell them I have to reschedule. So it wasn't even necessary for me to make up a lie. But the fact that it just came naturally for me to think, well, the uh, okay, I got to cancel it. I better tell them. Uh, something and so I got to make up something and when I realized that wait a second lying all these years as a Christian this is probably about 10 years ago that this happened and I'm thinking I was embarrassed and ashamed of myself thinking that look after all these years how much have I really grown I still instinctively lie it's part of my nature all right I don't know how much that was on topic or not but Okay, any more? Uh, did we, uh, did we uh, cover that verse? Everybody get a turn on that? Are we still live? 
Sorry, I couldn't get to my mouth. <laughs> well, I don't get any response from you. I'm just shocked. I, I, I'm shocked. I didn't realize you were you. I, I'm just so surprised to learn that you lied once in your life. I'm just still, oh. still. <laughs> well, more than once, but uh, but the, the point I'm making is I don't want to. Yeah. But still, even even now, as much as I don't want to lie, I don't want to do things. Uh, it, it becomes your natural uh, your natural uh, way of doing things until until it's not and 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 those kinds of behaviors gradually can change uh, and with the Holy Spirit renewing us and transforming us but it's it's not going to ever change completely as you said until we get the glorified bodies without the sin nature we'll have at least as some kind of remnant of this old nature at least to deal with. All right. Um, did everybody talk about 25? Let's shall we go to 26. I'll read 26 and 27 together. Ben, it says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Is that me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yes. I mean, when you're when you're angry, um, and I think we should. It's important that we deal with that. Uh, maybe not instantly. The, the the very moment that you're angry, it may not be wise to 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 because uh, a lot of times if you're angry, you're you're it's a it's a really uh, it's e super easy to slip right into the flesh and respond in kind, and that's exactly what we're not supposed to do. Uh, we're not supposed to um, uh, respond in kind, uh, return evil with evil, but return uh, evil with a blessing and so that we may receive a blessing. Um, and so, but, uh, so I think it's important that, um, but we, it's important maybe not to, to always respond instantly, but uh, quickly before the sun goes down, you know, not, not, not long after the event, because if you do, um, it, I think it festers and, and, and it grows and it grows worse and worse. And, um, I know that that's, this is true uh, from from my own experience, and I, even when I don't even realize, I can even lie to myself and say, "No, this is not bothering me. I'm not going to let this bother to me." But uh, nevertheless, um, if I don't deal with it, it does. It comes out, and um, it often often does uh, to be wrathful, and that's uh, wrath is a uh, it, it, that's a. The, Satan could easily use that. That's giving him a foothold, and he could easily use that to make it worse than it really is. Uh, and make the problem even worse than it really is. So you're you're being wrathful, and you respond more wrathfully. You may you may respond. You know you might respond not only uh, in about the injustice the justice that you felt by the other person, but you'll respond about all the things the person ever did to you that you didn't like. Uh, even personality quirks or something. So, um, yeah, resentment and bitterness, if it's allowed to continue, uh, it can, it, the devil can use it. And uh, definitely that's one of the ways he uses it, I believe, to divide uh, believers between each other. So um, I think it's important that we do re uh, deal with it uh, soon. And so it doesn't, uh, you know, fester and well up in, in both sides. Both people uh, be, grow more and more resentful and um, it just gets worse and worse. So I think it's important to deal with it uh, as quickly as, as 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 we can. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right, Sister Renee. Yeah, you know, a lot of people really misunderstand Paul when he uses Old Testament stuff. They'll they'll take it and go see, and they they don't get that he's showing how it was prophesied and how to make it applicable now. But this is either Proverbs or Psalms. I think it's David or Solomon that said that. Be angry and sin not or something. It's in one of those. And it's um, it's saying that your anger uh, itself, it's not, it's not sinful just to be angry. You have feelings. People have feelings. But it's an opportunity, like Ben was saying, for the enemy to come in and manipulate you into sin. And uh, or I recently had a brother call me and was, I mean, he was tore up about something somebody had said about him on somebody else's channel. And he was going to do that, do a video right now and said, and I was like, no, 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 breathe, 
and and pray on it and do that tomorrow. My advice wasn't taken, sadly. But I knew that anger, no matter how wrong the other person is, it's still an opportunity for the enemy to get at you. Right. And we're only responsible for what we do. So and I know I'm guilty of that. So I have to I have to breathe and then I pray on it. And usually I just don't even say anything. But this here is be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Try to deal with it quickly. And this is in, uh, mostly referencing amongst one another within the congregation. I mean, it's applicable to your day, your regular daily life and all relationships, too, as a Christian. But I believe it is it is uh, specifically talking about dealing with other brethren within the congregation uh, because he's saying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Uh, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So he's just letting you know that the devil will use your emotions that are completely valid and okay to have, but he will use those to get you stirred up to feel right in your sin. And that's a scary place to be when you feel justified in the sin you're going to commit. And uh, we have to be very careful as Christians. We have to understand the difference between righteous indignation against God, against his word and personal ego. Uh, one of uh, Brother Luke's friends said, you know, a dead man can't get offended. If you've reckoned yourself dead, let it roll off. That guy's dead. What does he care what's said about him? The new man deals with it differently. And so uh, I think this is uh, really important. Be, ang be angry and sin not. Okay, you're angry. That's fine. But don't let it be a way that the devil gets a foothold or gets a place to make you sin, uh, especially against one of the brethren. Hmm. Okay. Very interesting. Um, all right. Um, Brother Ben, did you go first on that one, Ray? Okay. Okay. Let me. Uh, uh, I was looking at some of these other translations, and it's, uh, I've got two different ways of interpreting this that are interesting. Uh, so let me read it in the Amplified. It says, Be angry. That is, at sin, at immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior, yet do not sin. Do not let your anger, uh, that is, uh, cause you shame, nor allow it to last until the sun goes down. Well, that's pretty clear what they're saying here, but they are saying, it's actually uh, a statement that's saying, be angry. It's, it's like, not a command, maybe, or maybe it is. It's telling us we should be angry at immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior. I know I, I am. As much as I know that I, I am certainly not perfect, and yet when I see horrible things going on, not only in the world at large, but, but especially in the church, it, it does make me sick. It, it just and, and I get angry and disgusted. Um, so I can see the point that they're making is telling us that be angry means, in other words, you should be angry at these things. Well, uh, as I look at this, uh, another translation, let me see, it says, uh, uh, let me see. In your, okay, uh, in your anger, do not sin. So in other words, this translation is, is, is saying, if you do get angry, that at the times when you do get angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So in one translation, they're, they're interpreting it as, or there will be times where you get angry. And in those, those cases, don't, don't let it lead you into sin. And then this, this amplified, it's telling us you should be angry. I'm not sure is there, which is the right way to interpret that. Well, what are your, your thoughts on that?
I, I, I didn't look at it. I haven't spent time on it. I couldn't answer. I, I was trying to answer. There's a prayer request that was kind of serious. I was trying to get it and write it down. I'm sorry. All right. So is the verse telling us you should be angry in immorality? Yeah, I, agree with that. I agree with your uh, what you're saying there. I That's why I was saying it's it's hard to discern between righteous indignation and our ego. You know, there are things we should uh, take offense at and be angry at. Um, although I see what you're saying here specifically. He's saying you should be angry. I, I think that's a possibility. Although I I talk I took it as um, relation between the members of the body body of Christ. Um, you know, but yeah, uh, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. I get that. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely true in any case. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. So, Ben, do you do you see the distinction that the, the two ways of interpreting it that I pointed out? Yes, I do. Um, and I think I think uh, you know the way that uh, way that. Um, to, to, to Are you there? <sighs> All right. Sorry, I'm going. juggling too many windows. Um, too much, too much juggling too much at once. Um, yeah, I, I can see it both ways. Um. I, I think it basically is saying uh, the way the, the pattern I see in scripture is okay. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're angry, essentially, um, do not sin and do not let do not let your anger, because uh, he's even saying right there, you know, if you're anger, do not let your anger uh, to uh, do not let you know don't let it last. Essentially, uh, d deal with it promptly. You know, uh, communicate your grievances. Um, but don't be wrathful about it is essentially how I kind of interpret that. All right. But of those two ways, do you favor one, one interpretation over the other? Well, I, I, uh, naturally I read it the, the first way, which was, uh, you know, uh, don't be angry essentially. Um, but I, I, I agree with you now that, uh, I think it, it makes more sense, um, to say, you know, yeah, it's, it's okay to be angry, but uh, just don't let it, don't don't let it, don't let it allow you to, you know, don't become don't let it become wrathful, um, and because again, uh, that against especially with 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 our fellow brethren, there's no reason reason to be wrathful. It's better that we be cheated, and it's better that we you know turn the other cheek, um, but uh, but yeah, even then, if 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 the other person doesn't respond to our grievances, um, you know, following a bit of biblical protocol for dealing with such things, um, even then, uh, if they, you know, vengeance belongs to the uh, belongs to God. I think there's a verse in First Thess Thessalonians four where it talks about uh, let no one um, uh, defraud his brother, um, and I think the, the context is sexual immorality um, within the church, and, and do not let you know. Don't let anyone defraud such a person because God is the avenger of such. Um, so that uh, again, even if, uh, if if God, you know, if the person doesn't respond to us and and our and our and our cause is just, um, well then, you know, the, the vengeance is it's God's, not ours. So, um, I, yes, I see. I see the second uh, interpretation. I, that I I actually think it's favorable. Okay. All right, let's go to the next verse. Renee, uh, verse uh, 27 says, neither give place to the devil. Well, we, I mean, I actually did do that verse. Uh, we did both, I thought, when we did it. If I went ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. it should included. I should have included it in the uh, reading originally. I can see that now, but I didn't. Semicolon. See the semicolon, that's why I kept reading. Uh, let the sun go down uh, on your wrath, but neither give place to the devil. Like it's all one thought, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's what I was saying. If, if you allow your ego to be bruised and you let your anger fester uh, and then you just, is, you know, it says let not the sun go down. So deal with it uh, immediately rather than letting it fester and then giving a place to the devil to use your legitimate feelings to encourage you to sin, 
uh, uh, Steve made a good point. He goes, well, what happens when the sun goes down? There's darkness. So don't let your anger be festering within the darkness because that's when uh, sin and, and evil plots build. That's when they're made in the dark. So uh, that was really good. Do you, do you want to go to 28? No, let me get ben, let me get Ben's thought on just on uh, that one um, twenty seven, and and then we'll go on. Ben, what what do you see? Do you have any more you want to focus no, on? No, I don't really have any more. I I also uh, assumed it or read ahead myself that it just felt like a, a continuing sentence. Okay. Um, so, all right, let me let me read verse twenty seven in the Amplified before we go on, just to see what it says. It says, "And do not give the devil an opportunity." to lead you into sin by holding a grudge or nurturing anger or harboring resentment or cultivating bitterness. Yeah. Uh, I, I think getting back to the, the question I asked last time about uh, these two interpretations here, uh, I, I was, I think I would lean towards the interpretation that uh, it's telling us we should be angry at, at uh, evil in the world uh, but we won't have to be careful to not that that let our anger, which is a righteous thing, don't let it turn into a bad thing by by uh, uh, going too far with it. So that now now you're engaging in uh, um, let me see twenty uh, let's see. Uh, it leads you into sin by holding a grudge or nurturing anger or harboring resentment or cultivating bitterness. If we go further with it and it becomes any of these things, then the righteous anger that we had over evil, uh, now it's no longer righteous anger because we've taken it too far. Uh, all right, we can go to the next verse unless you want to say more about 27. Well, I, I think you're. I think you're right. Um, the second interpretation uh, makes more sense. Guys, certainly, he's not saying be angry. Uh, you know, I think he's saying when you're angry. You know, he's basically saying when you're angry, make sure you don't sin. Don't let it. Don't let it get out of control. Uh, don't let it uh, turn into something like bitterness and wrath. Um, and uh, Steve's point was amazing. Um, that that's awesome. So that's all I would say. I don't, I'm not aware of Steve's point. What do you mean? When he said, don't let the sun go down, you know, that's, that's darkness. And that's when, uh, you know, I, I, it, I think that's where you can, you can seep into your inner, inner, uh, you know, you can dream about it and turn it, turn it something worse. Um, so that, that that's what Steve was saying. Yeah, but I'm not aware. You're talking about Steve in the chat room? Yeah. Soldier, soldier for Christ. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't read his comments, so maybe you can enlighten me. What do you mean? What did he say? Uh, well, well, Renee, Renee uh, saw what he said. Uh, she mentioned it earlier. All right. Okay. All right. Let's just go on. That just because a person gets saved, it doesn't mean these behaviors stop magically. You know, you still have the old man to contend with. And Paul here is saying, yeah, you can be a Christian and still be a thief, but you shouldn't be. And you need to cut it out. And the reason you should be working is because not just for yourself, but since all the members are one body, so that you can feed those that cannot, like the widows and the orphans and the disabled, uh, if someone is in need. Uh, so let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that need it, so that he can contribute and help the community of believers, the church itself. So uh, this is a verse that proves that a believer can still do these terrible things. Now, we're not promoting that. None of us are, nor are we condoning that behavior. Uh, it's just, it, I hear so many preachers saying, well, if you're really saved, you won't do this, this, and this. If you, you got to live up to whatever standard of righteousness they think you can have. But what they should be doing is say, hey, you need to walk in your identity in Christ, not you never really were saved. I mean, that's, you didn't mean it. You weren't serious they, because they think salvation is something you do, a commitment you make, a promise you make, something you're doing. Uh, but we have to divide that. And it's very clear here that uh, believers are instructed to uh, walk in the new man. And one of those ways is to stop being a thief and learn to 
uh, work and not just for your own needs, but that you can be a giver to those that are in need in the church. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, Ben, what do you say? I really don't have anything to add to that. Uh, as perfectly stated, um, that's really my only, uh, that's one of, my, one of my concerns, you know, about a job. I don't really care about anything else other than I want to be useful to people and not only in what in my labor, but the fruit of my labor, I also want to benefit others. So, um, but Renee, Renee covered it perfectly. You know, we, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't, uh, you know, people, some people, I think, uh, I know, I know people, my, my, my wife goes to a local church, um, and there was, a there, there are people there that take advantage of the, uh, the generosity of the church where, uh, you know, the, the, I think there's a, they had like a ho some housing available that was supposed to be for the pastor for him to live, but, um, that someone else took it. Uh, they, this person was in desperate need. So the pastor had to move out of it and live with his daughter, I think. And then she took over and they, they and it was only supposed to let me a, a couple months, but end up turning it to years. Um, and it was a very difficult situation to back out of. So, um, it should have never gotten to that far in the, in the first place, but, um, yeah, I mean, like, like Paul, like, I don't know if Renee already said this or not, but if Paul said if, if someone doesn't uh, work, then he doesn't eat. And I think that's a good principle. Okay. All right. Let me read uh, verse 28 in the Amplified. It says, the thief who has become a believer must no longer steal, but instead he must work hard, uh, making an honest living producing that which is good with his own hands so that he will have something to share with those in need. Um, I don't think this one is talking about self-reliance uh, as much as the idea of, you know, helping others. Um, but uh, uh, the idea of working with your hands, I've always found that interesting. Uh, uh, the points made here, but I, I do remember Paul talking about working with your hands uh, as, as a virtuous thing. Um, I think it's, there, it's someplace else where Paul talks about the, the, it is good for us to work with our hands. Um, maybe someone can remember where that is. But uh, so it says that we, if, you're a, if you were a thief and you're now you're a believer, uh, no, don't, don't keep on stealing. Uh, instead, uh, uh, work and earn honest living and and then with that with what you produce now you'll be able to help others um i yeah obviously being able to uh, be self-reliant is uh you know obviously uh that's a, a biblical principle but another biblical principle is charity and and that is helping others so not only does a person have a responsibility to take care of themselves but it not everybody's able to do that at all stages of their life. I mean, obviously, when someone's a newborn, <laughs> they can't take care of themselves. They're, they're, they're in need of someone taking care of them. The same thing is when you get really old. Uh, and the same thing is for people who are handicapped in some way or the, the people who are un just unfortunate. Maybe the economy or, or sickness or something happens and it creates a, or puts them in a terrible situation where they need help. So, yeah, let's let's be self-reliant. If a person is not willing to 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 work, that's that's different. But a person who's willing to work but doesn't can't find work. I mean, we have an obligation to each other to help each other. Uh, all right. Let's any more before I go to verse twenty nine. All right, uh, I think Brother Ben, it's your turn to go first. So let's go. Verse 29 says, uh, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Hmm. Um, well, I. Uh Again, that's pretty much uh, self-explanatory. Um, you know, our words should be graceful. Jesus' words were uh, graceful. Um, 
and I, I can't remember. There's the uh, I think there's a, a I think it's a it's in the Gospels, synoptic Gospels, where Jesus was preaching in a synagogue, and said they were amazed by the gracious words that that uh, proceeded out of his mouth, um, and so we obviously should be emulating Christ in that regard. We should not be uh, looking to tear tear people down. Look for uh, you know not be fault finders uh, and find ways that we can criticize people, but rather uh, encourage people, be, be encouragers and um building up one another not not in a way we don't we don't want to lie as we just talked about we don't want to lie and say things that are not true but uh we should be looking for the best in people and looking for ways to uh stir one and one another up in good works and um and so yeah we, again we, we i don't think we should be you know we, we should not use coarse language coarse joking uh we should uh we should always be looking for things that build one another up Okay. Brother, right. You know, I was reading Proverbs one night and I, I found like 12 different verses on this subject just on two pages that I was reading. And it was basically uh, the advice to stop backbiting, gossiping, and lying. It was all about loose tongues and false witness. And, you know, corrupt communication can be to you personally, or it can be about you. And so when I saw him, when I saw this word here, it said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, like Ben said, to encourage or uplift, right? But not just to you personally, but if I say something about you to someone, that is not edifying. That tears you down. It tears the person down. It makes them uncomfortable because now they they can't trust me and they've heard something ugly about you and they don't know if they should tell you. That's corrupt communication. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So it, it should, um, not only should, I not say anything that would discourage you or hurt your faith, but I shouldn't say anything to another about you that could also uh, be corrupt communication. And I think that this is one of the major problems in the churches. And for all these sinless people that think they don't sin anymore, they are the worst bunch of clucking hens I have ever heard in my life. You wouldn't believe some of the ridiculous gossip they spread about other people and still claim that they are without sin. I think that is one of the worst sins in the in the uh, church today. Backbiting and gossip and it's corrupt communication and it's spoken against severely uh, in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. I'm going to read 29 in the Amplifier. It says, do not let unwholesome, that is, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. Hmm. Let me see. In the... Uh, you, uh, Rene, you were focusing on gossip, uh, and this is focusing more on profanity. Uh, uh, I'm sure both would have, could apply here. Uh, these are things we should not be doing. We should not be, uh, should never, should not come out of our mouths. But uh, um, you know, the, one of the things that's really surprised me uh, as I've been here on YouTube, uh, uh, there are some YouTube channels that are, uh, they're professing believers. They, uh, they're quite busy and very active um, producing programs, having hangouts, having discussions uh, about the Bible uh, and the gospel. Um, and yet the, uh, the language that is, is, um, freely used is really uh, would would be a violation of this verse here according to the amplified foul profane worthless vulgar uh, I've been surprised that some of the professing uh, Christian ministers 
uh, have so freely uh, used things. Sometimes it's the spoken word, and sometimes it's the written word in a in a, in the chat. Or, but it's actually profane and vulgar. Really, I'm, I'm, I literally literally mean vulgar. So um, it not only d disturbs me. Uh, I guess going back to the previous verse, uh, be angry. Uh, yeah, I, I'm angry about it. It, it. I find it disgusting. Um, but it also, I find it disgusting that uh, when I see people uh, conducting themselves in that way, uh, it's obvious to me that I, I don't want an affiliation with them. I, I, I don't want to participate. I don't want to be associated with it. Uh, because even if, I, if I'm there, and even if I'm not engaging in it, if I'm there, then I'm guilty to a certain extent of condoning it. If I'm going to be there, I need to at least speak out against it and then leave. But I should not just be there and have all this profanity and vulgarity and, and gossip and, you know, all these things that we've been talking about tonight, things that come out of our mouths. If we, if we see this going on, and we're there, and we're not, but we're not engaging it in ourselves. But we're not speaking out against it. You're condoning it, and and you're guilty, as far as I can, in my judgment. All right, that's verse twenty nine. Uh, any more in twenty nine before I go to thirty? Yeah, Steve was saying it says impart grace in the NIV. Uh, I guess that could be fine too. But when I first saw it, I got nervous because. I know the Catholics say that he imparts grace. He imparts righteousness rather than impute. And what it means for them is that he gives a little bit of it so that they can do it. Not that it's imputed unto us. So I got confused there what Steve was saying and I, I got upset about how it was worded, but I'm fine with that now that I look at it. Um, and which verse are you saying is the part? It, that it may impart grace, he said, is what it says in the NIV. In which verse? The one we just read. 29? Yeah, where it says, I'm, I'm not it I'm not may minister, I'm, it says minister grace in the King James. Yeah, but I'm looking at the uh, NIV, and I don't see that word impart in there. Oh. I'll read it in the NIV. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Oh, huh. okay. Oh, I get I get what Steve's saying. We impart grace and Christ imputes grace. I thought he was saying something else when he posted it there. So, yeah, I'm clear on that now. All right, let's go to verse 30. And I think, Renee, it's your turn to go first. Uh, uh, and, 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 okay, here it is, Renee. I love this verse. Yeah. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Yeah, I don't know what people against uh, the gospel and eternal security do with this verse. Uh, because I hear him say, then Nori was so funny. He said, those people that say things like, if you're really saved, well, if they were really saved, they wouldn't say things like, if you're really saved. But it, it's true. Because how would this verse work? If all Christians just supernaturally always just served the Lord and gave every error of their life to Christ and gave up all their sin, that why why would he tell us don't do these things? To, uh, put off the old man, put on the new one, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And then confirms our eternal security that we're sealed by him until the day of redemption when the body is redeemed. The literal purchase possession is picked up. So I, I don't know what they do with this verse. I've heard people say you can unseal it, but this is your seal till the day of redemption. They always try to find a way to take away eternal security. Like if God's not dangling you over hell, you won't behave. You'll just go crazy in sin if you know you're saved. And this verse just does a double whammy on that false doctrine because Paul tells us don't grieve the Holy Spirit. If a Christian 
couldn't commit these sinful things that grieve the Holy Spirit, then why would Paul tell us not to grieve the Holy Spirit? And then continues to feed our faith that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. He's with us forever. So don't grieve him because he's always with you. I, I don't know what they do with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly a proof text for uh, eternal security. Uh, okay, Brother Ben, verse 30. Well, we, we grieve, definitely grieve the Holy Spirit through sin. Um, that's really the only reason why the Holy Spirit would be grieved is our sin. Um, uh, but but yet again, it is a uh, it is a promise that's sealed. That's a that's a you know what God does. He doesn't do it in vain. When He seals something, uh, no man can break it, including yourself. And um, it, it's really a strong encouragement and, and a strong uh, eternal security uh, verse. Again, we're sealed to the day of redemption, not sealed until we until we sin next, or not sealed. Uh, until we um, uh, grieve the Holy Spirit, we're, we're, we're sealed forever. You, you once you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit forever, and um, and it, it's again it's a wonderful eternal security verse. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'll read thirty in the Amplified. It says, "And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, uh, but seek to please Him." by whom you were sealed and marked, that is, branded as God's own for the day of redemption, that is, the final deliverance from the consequences of sin. Uh, the um, I've never really had a problem with this word, uh, but I do notice a difference in some of the other translations where it says, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption unto um I, unto uh, does it mean the same thing as until uh, uh i don't know I've, I've always thought of it that way that's when once once we're redeemed so we're sealed yeah. until we're redeemed yep. but won't we have the holy spirit even after the glorification and uh, that's the redemption i i would say so we're redeemed and it com it's everything's completed at the glorification but does that mean that we're no longer sealed uh, uh, because we're only sealed until the day of redemption? We're, we're perfected. We're perfected. We have the new body, the, the perfect sinless body without the sin nature and everything. So I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but if I look at this in, uh, let me see other translations, it's uh, 30, uh, I think the point is he's reminding us that the Holy Spirit is always with us and is grieved uh, whenever we do these things. So, uh, uh, some of the other translations say for the day of redemption. Let me see, for verse 30. Yeah. You were sealed for the day of redemption. Uh, you were sealed... Uh, in which you were sealed to a day of redemption. You were sealed for not talking us as his. It, it seems that the um, the most common translation is sealed for the day of redemption. Uh, we're sealed for that, and but whether it's unto or until or for, I'm not sure that there's a, a great distinction in any of those. Really, that I may be making too big of a deal out of it. But do, do we think that uh, even at glorification, uh, the Holy Spirit will continue to be in us uh, and throughout eternity? I don't know how that works because we're going to be in the presence of God. You know, we have a we don't have the sin nature anymore. We're a new man connected with Christ. I mean, Christ in us, the hope of glory. I'm assuming he stays in us forever. Mm hmm. I don't know if there's anything that I, I can't think of anything that specifically uh, answers that question. I, I, it's, I've, I've always assumed that it's permanent, but when yeah. it says unto the day of redemption, it always made me wonder, well, what happens then? Do we no longer have the ceiling? Is the spirit leave us? Yeah. It served its purpose. I don't think that's Paul's point, you know, that well, he's only with you until you're redeemed in the body. Yeah. I think he's saying he's always going to be with you. So don't grieve him. 
these things grieve him and he's with you until you're redeemed. I mean, and he, and you're sealed, you're set apart by God, you're marked, uh, you're his and that he's always in you. I, th I think that's the whole point is that he's faithful. He stays with you. Remember, he sees everything you're doing and it grieves him. I, I think that's more the point of it. Not that one day. Yeah. You're yeah. I, I, I is always. Yeah, I agree that that's not really the primary point that's being made. Uh, that I, I might be making more of that unto than than is necessary. Hendrix wrote, uh, "Sealed unto the day of redemption," aka the seal is there to mark you, so God knows who to redeem or fulfill. Um, well, that that makes sense. Except my only objection to that, brother, is uh, so God knows. Uh, I would think would God would know whether whether that's uh, that, that's the, the case or not. And God, I, I, I believe in the full omniscience of God, and I don't think he needs to have us marked in that way to know. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's it's so that God can identify us. Um, well, the angels identify the sealed believers in the revelation, the 144,000 that have the seal of God on their heads. The angels, don't they identify them? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if the, it's for the angels to recognize us or what, but it is true that we all get a mark as believers. Um, there's a mark for non-believers, uh, yep. 666, the mark, but, but 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 the believers are also marked. Yeah, he's a counterfeiter, so he's going to mark in the flesh, and God marks in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to read 31 and 32 together. Uh, Whose turn is it to go first this time? Is it Ben? It's Ben's turn. Okay, Ben, 31 and 32 reads, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Let me try to catch up here. Uh, yes. Um, again, th that's that's exactly what we, we should be doing. The, the the law brings about these these things like bitterness, uh, malice. Uh, you know, the law makes you selfish and and, and self centered, and grace makes you. Um, selfless essentially it should uh, the law principle makes you uh concerned about yourself and really yourself only uh, but again the grace principle is the exact opposite of that it 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 it's supposed to get you to think to realize that no it, it's not about you. you 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 actually uh forsake yourself essentially um and look to for the betterment and the best interest of others and uh and obviously to god so um uh, you know, even when, uh, like we talked about earlier about the believers, uh, uh, you know, be not angry and sin not, you know, let, 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 let your, uh, wrath, um, go, let the sun go down on your wrath. Again, that, that's what we should be, what we should be focusing on is forgiving one another, uh, as Christ, just, just as Christ forgave us. When we, when we reflect on all the things that we've done, um, I think about this all the time, just, I'm just, you know, I'm, I am a failure every day. I'm like, I'm shocked. It's like, you know, you mentioned earlier about lying, uh, Luke, that, that uh, definitely, um, that pricked me because I, I still do those things at work. I, I make up excuses, um, uh, so that, you know, cause, cause well, but for believers, I, I know I can pretty much tell a believer, another fellow believer anything and they'll understand, or at least they should, but the outside world, they're, they're not so forgiving. Uh, they don't, they don't care about that. You know, business is pretty cruel. Um. I don't care about your feelings, um, but with, with believers, uh, we all know that we we have been forgiven, and then we've all there's so much that we need forgiveness for on a daily basis. And if, you know, if that's true, then certainly we should we should have that same attitude towards one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, Renee, thirty one and thirty two. All right. Yeah, he's continuing. Just a reminder, everybody, continuing 
about putting on the new man and not grieving the spirit. So let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as for God, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And I love this verse because I am so sick of people doing videos claiming they went on a trip to hell because of unforgiveness that they thought they were saved, but because of the sin, they didn't forgive somebody. They were sent to hell and they misunderstand the verse. So their theology is off. So they have their visions that uh, work around their wrong theology. And so they'll put uh, what Jesus said that your father in heaven, if you don't forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive you. Well, how do you, how do you like that for the law standards? You got to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You better forgive or God's not going to forgive you. But Paul tells us you, you should forgive because you've already been forgiven. So it's wrong. It's an evil servant. Like Jesus said, it's a wicked servant to be forgiven such a great debt and refuse to give forgiveness for something so small. And so, um, this verse clearly says that we already have been forgiven. And so when you hear someone say that, they are just not understanding scripture. They are taking verses Jesus said to Israel before he died to encourage his people to forgive uh, and to uh, reveal God's love for them. And to show them the standards of the law, because many of them thought that they were righteous and kept it. All these I've kept since my youth. What lack I yet? Many of them really thought that. And so he, he lifted the standards up to show what God's standards truly are. Uh, but no, um, we are already forgiven. And it's a wicked servant that doesn't forgive uh after he's been get, forgiven such a great debt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. So I'll read 31 and 32 in the Amplified. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, that is perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding, and slander be put away from you, along with every kind of malice, that is all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Uh, so these two verses, uh, really, they, they kind of go hand in hand. On 31 is saying that we need to get rid of these things and we need to embrace in 32 we need to embrace these things <clears throat> uh, i would say easier said than done um because we as we've said of course you, until glorification we still have that old man and as we i said in the beginning you, you know you can try to feed the new man and starve the old man and then the, the 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 holy spirit gets the victory and transforms you and you embrace the spirit and you surrender your will over to the spirit and uh you you grow and mature and and you you don't uh have uh bitterness wrath anger and so on you instead you you have uh compassion understanding forgiveness so this is what we want to happen but uh again uh, I, we we could never do this on our own, uh, and, and even with the Holy Spirit wanting to transform us, uh, it, it doesn't always happen because we resent resisted the Spirit. Um, so I, I guess the most important thing we we need to learn to do is uh, we. There is a, a fallacy in preaching the gospel where, where the false gospel message is that you need to surrender your will over to God in order to be saved. Uh, in other words, you uh, you repent to the extent that now you're only going to be doing what God wants you to do and not your, not your own will. 
uh, and, and that's that's a necessity for salvation. Well, that's adding works, and it and it ruins the gospel. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, desiring to for that to happen is something that we should want, and and, uh, and it, we want it to happen. But we've said this before: it, we're we're unique individuals. Some people are going to grow and mature spiritually uh, to great heights and quickly. Some people grow and mature more slowly over their lifetime, and some people don't seem to grow and mature much or at all. Uh, so, but this, this should not serve as a test. Unfortunately, many people use that as a test uh, to judge a person's salvation. So we must never judge someone's salvation based upon how well they've been able to do verse 31 and 32. Uh, but this should be our objective. This should be what we desire. And we're, we're working towards that, working, yeah, not to get saved, but to grow. It is, we do have part of the responsibility to grow and mature. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it is a synergism. The Holy Spirit's transforming us, but we need to not resist it, but embrace the Spirit and, and, and let the spirit, spirit do its work on us. Uh, I wanted to answer this. It's a funny way it's worded, Brother Luke, but it, it made me giggle a little bit. Uh, the way it's worded is weird, but I just want to clarify this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. It kind of sounds like in English, hey, put that stuff away um, with malice. Do it with malice. That's not what I'm saying. It, it's just the way it's worded. He's uh, just continuing his thought and saying, all, and he's basically just saying, uh, put all that away with malice to put the malice away too definitely so it's like let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice so any kind of um malicious feeling you have towards someone put that away with all this other stuff that that's all it's just worded weirdly <laughs> but, yeah i think that should be understood to be not with malice that you're doing it with malice in your uh, heart but i'm including <laughs> malice I include yeah. malice along with anger and clamor and the other things. Yeah. Malice is also included. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, uh, Hendrix, um, he's brought to our attention that uh, we've gone over our time. He's, are we going to go into another hour? Well, I thought since we were so close to the end and we only had a couple more verses that we, we might go a little longer to conclude the chapter. So we were, we did, did that. Uh, so let's give our summaries now, and then uh, I want to make an announcement about those interviews that we've been discussing. So, uh, uh, Brother Ben, first, uh, let's hear your uh, your summary remarks about the study tonight. Well, one thing, um, Ephesians is, is a uh, we talked we touched on it briefly or a little bit already, but um, Ephesians one of, is one of the uh, epistles that goes into our 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 spiritual anatomy. And um, it, we, you probably heard, we, we said a couple things, a couple terms tonight that might be um, uh, unfamiliar for new believers. Um, things like the old man, the new man, the sin nature, the new nature. And so um, those things can be a little bit confusing. Um, and I thought I would read a quote that I found very helpful to um, understand the relationship of those of, of the new nature, of the natures that we have, in the, in the new man and the old man. So I'll read it here. It says, The old man speaks of the unregenerate self, who people were in the sight of God before the new birth, being positionally in Adam. Likewise, the new man speaks of the believer's regenerate self, who the believer is after the new birth, being positionally in Christ. The Bible teaches that there is a difference between the believer's spiritual position in the sight of God versus his constitutional makeup as a total person. For example, before a person trusts Christ and is born again, God does not see that person as a sin nature. Instead, he sees that person as an old man in Adam who possesses a sin nature. Similarly, after one is born again, God does not see the see that person as a new as a new divine nature he sees that person as a new man in christ who possesses a new nature 
The old man versus new man references in Paul's epistles speak of a person's position and identification with either Adam or Christ. They speak of someone as being either an ungenerate person in Adam or a regenerate person in Christ. On the other hand, Scripture also maintains a distinction regarding a person's nature. The sin nature and new nature are constitutional rather than positional, and they refer to what a person possesses internally in terms in terms of constitutional makeup. Um, so again, we uh, born again believers. We our old man has died. Our old man died with Christ. Um, you know, you have the old man, the Old Testament, the old dragon. Um, all the old things are temporary. And um, just like the Old Testament, it, 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 not the Old Testament was uh, temporary, but the law and that the whole uh, ministry under the law was temporary, where the things that are new, they're eternal and they last forever. The new, the new covenant, the New Testament, uh, the new man, um, the new covenant. Um, so... I think that's helpful in understanding that, um, again, when the Bible speaks of the old man, it's talking about our, who we were in Adam. The new man is who we are in Christ. And so uh, we touched upon that a little bit already, but I think uh, as we read, uh, as we further uh, study uh, Ephesians, uh, Paul will be re referencing that even more. So hopefully that was helpful. But I, uh, it was a really great study tonight, and uh, we're on to the next chapter. Ben, I loved how that was worded. I don't know where you found it, but I love that. Um, people don't understand our permanent position in Christ. And that's why there's so much false teaching. They think our position has to do with our behavior. Our position has to do with Christ. It has nothing to do with us. Our position is in Christ based on his merit. I like how Harry Ironside said, it's not giving your best to Christ. It's Christ's best put on your account. And so, uh, sadly, most people are still relying on their own righteousness. They think their own righteousness is helping them instead of rightly understanding that every believer is a new man, but has an old one, the flesh. But we're supposed to reckon that it already died. We're supposed to imagine in our head that it was crucified with Jesus on the cross. And so we, we renew our minds. That's how we get a change, you know, knowing who we are in Christ. So I really like how you put that, Ben. But I'm really enjoying the study. And this is why I like to do it live with the people in the chat room. You guys are so funny, but you see things like, you know, with malice. That, that That's important, you know, that uh, things look off like that and that we discuss them or uh, unto the day of redemption. It, it's important we look at these things and dig deeper in them. So um, I really enjoyed the study tonight. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, this is Wednesday. Uh, t tomorrow, uh, th Thursday, Renee, um, are you, is your uh, Thursday throwdown still on hold? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Right now. Okay, it's on hold till further notice. Uh, yeah. But I believe uh, we still have a uh, Steve's program uh, scheduled for Thursday. Uh, ben, do you know anything about that? Can you tell us what time and, and uh, tell everybody what to look for for the, tomorrow? Uh, yes, it's on Steve's channel. I talked to him today. He's planning on doing it, uh, last I knew. And um, it usually starts around 7 o'clock, but it actually, a lot of times we, we start at 7 o'clock, uh, but the program and the, the actual content of the program doesn't start around 8 o'clock. Um, but uh, Steve will probably send out a, uh, a channel or a program reminder uh, very soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and then, of course, Friday, we have the Fun Fellowship Friday a program on this same channel, Church of the Eternally Secure, 930 Eastern Time. Make sure you join us for that if you want to have a lot of fun on Friday nights. Uh, but it, it is our goal and our desire to have a live program uh, every evening, every seven days a week. 
right now we've got Wednesday Bible study, Thursday, uh, Renee or, or Steve, and then uh, Friday, then uh, Saturday, Sister Lisa has a program, and then Sunday is the church service. Monday and Tuesday, we don't have anything scheduled. But now we, we're going to try to uh, get programs for Monday and Tuesday. Um, uh, so give us some time to create that. But we are going to start a Tuesday night program. Uh, we, we thought we might get it kicked off last night, but it uh, turns out next Tuesday will be the, the first one. And what, what we're going to do is uh, attempt to interview uh, the, um, the, the, the people who are on our panels and also the moderators in the chat room. Uh, so there'll probably be 10 or 15 people who will be interviewed. And um, so we'll start off next uh, Tuesday. And Sister Renee and I decided that um, it might be better for Renee to uh, interview the sisters and I'll interview the brothers. So, but we'll start off the first two Tuesdays. I'll interview Renee next Tuesday, and then she'll interview me the following Tuesday, and then we'll pick it up with with uh, Ben and and the the, the others. So uh, that uh, that will give everybody uh, a program six days a week, uh, and and eventually we want to get something else going on Monday so that you have a program seven nights a week. There's something for you uh, for uh, your your your, your Bible studies and fellowship. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for putting up with uh, going overtime tonight. Uh, and uh, we'll pick it up uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Thank you, everybody in the congregation. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.